above all, the name that has all power. Psalms 34, verse 3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. You know, that's what's great about coming to the house of the Lord. You don't got to come by yourself, but you come with a body of believers. You come with your brother and your sister, and you can say, you know what, I don't have to worship alone this morning. But you know what, if my worship's a little weak, I can begin to feel the worship that's coming beside me. They can begin to lift me up and begin to push me forward, saying, you know what, my week may not have went the way I wanted to. I may not have woke up on the right side of the bed this morning, but the King of kings and the Lord of lords is here in this house this morning, and he's come to give me strength. He's come to lift me up. He's come to bring healing and restoration in the house this morning. If you're weak, there's strength here. If you're broken, the healer's here. So why don't we begin to lift him up right now? Why don't we begin to magnify him right now? Because we're in the presence of a king that can do anything. Lord, I pray right now that you begin to move through this house. Lord, begin to touch us, begin to strengthen us, Lord. Lord, I pray the worship that's going on around somebody would begin to lift their spirit, would begin to build them up, Lord. They may not have had everything go right this week, but, Lord, they're in the place where everything can be set right, where everything can be put back on course. And I pray right now, Lord, that your anointing would begin to move and flow through every singer, through every musician, Lord, through the word that's going to be preached this morning. And I pray right now that there be lives that be touched. There would be lives that would be restored in this house this morning. Lord, let something come to pass this morning. Lord, that would change somebody's eternity. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we lift you up. Lord, there are none like you. There are none that can stand beside you. And Lord, I pray that you would have your way. Lord, from the beginning to the end, if you believe that, why don't you begin to clap your hands and lift up a voice to the Lord saying, Lord, have your way this morning in the name of Jesus. Anybody glad for that river that begins to flow, that brings life? It's not just some reservoir, but it's a river that brings life in every situation and every circumstance. And I'm thankful today for that blood that runs all the way from Calvary to today. They can touch every sin. They can touch every infirmity, everything that I have that's going wrong in my life. He can make it right in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. It's good to see each and every one of you this morning, our guests as well. And at this moment, why don't we take a second and go around and greet somebody and tell them you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord this morning. is our next steps class will start again in August on Wednesday nights at 730 in room 103. Uh, these classes are designed for anyone interested in learning basic biblical doctrine. The class will be four weeks long on Wednesday nights and it will cover the word of God, the one true God, the new birth, and faithfulness and stewardship. So if you're interested in that, if you're a new convert or you don't know too much about um, the word of God, or the one true God, that class is available for you starting in August. And at this time, if we could stand across the house, we're going to worship the Lord in our giving this morning. Is anybody glad? We can say, you know what, I can come to the house of the Lord, and not only can he give to me, but I can give to him and bless his kingdom for all that he's blessed me. Every good thing we have is a gift from him. Amen. Why don't we pray over this offering right now? Lord, we come before you this morning thankful for the opportunity to give to your kingdom, Lord, to bless you like you've blessed us. Lord, I pray that you would use this offering, Lord, to bless your kingdom and, Lord, those who give this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have a knee in your body, we invite you to the front this morning to pray the prayer of faith.
no mountain that he cannot move no situation that he cannot turn around our God can do anything amen amen I believe it you believe it amen I'm so thankful so very very thankful thankful for the faith I feel in this place thankful for God's people gathered here today Worshiping together, loving Him, expecting Him to do great things, knowing that He is able. Amen, amen. So great to see everybody here this morning. All your fans, turn to a couple people next to you. Tell them, I'm so glad you're here today. Thank you, praise team. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for leading us into the presence of God. Amen, amen. So good to see Brother Craig. Welcome home. Welcome home, Brother Craig. Sister Corinthian, too. Welcome home. My goodness. Oh, Pastor. Look, everybody loves summer, but as a pastor, I really like it when it gets ready for school to start because people start all coming home, and I'm like, oh, I love it, I love it, I love it. Keep our quiz team in mind. We know that they are uh, competing at nationals right now, and uh, that God would help them and give them peace and help them not to be nervous I'm, they study hard they put a lot of time they are incredible incredible young people and we're just believing that God would be with them all of them not just ours but I'm thankful for every one of those quizzers up there just it, so incredible amen there's quite a the scripture today I'm, I'm going to kind of get into a little different so we're going to pray and I'm going to allow you to be seated but I want us I want us to pray I I believe with all my heart, I, I, I know that God has a word for us this morning. It has been confirmed again and again already. And, uh, boy, if you walked into this place, and, I, and I, you know, in today's society, you could just about throw a stick into just about any part of the crowd and hit somebody going through something if you hit somebody breathing. You, these pews may even be going through something. But, I know that God is able, and I want to let you, I just want to remind somebody today of something you already know. I know you know it. You know, sometimes I like to hear stuff that I already know. I, you know, I remember when I was with my dad and I was walking through the woods, I'm like, I don't think we're lost. No, no, I, I, I think we're on the right. But, but it didn't hurt every now and then. I'd be like, hey, hey, you, you know where we're at? 
in, 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 in my heart of hearts, I, I, I didn't think we were lost and I knew we were okay, but it was getting a little unrecognizable, and so it made me feel really good. He's like, oh, no, no, I know where we are. The, the such said, oh, oh, no, no, I, yeah, I, I know, I know. I just, I just need to, need to hear, need to hear you tell me something I already knew. You, you know, I was kind of questioning what I knew. Already. You ever had that? You're like, oh, I know God is able, but I'd like to, I'd like somebody to tell me and remind me that he's able. And I'm going to do that this morning with the help of the Lord. Lord Jesus, we love you, and I thank you for loving us. Thank you for your mercy that was new this morning before we opened our eyes. Thank you for your goodness, your everlasting kindness. Lord, I ask that you would minister in this place. You know where we are. You know every struggle going on. You know every question that goes through our mind. But God, I thank you for loving us and loving us enough to want to speak to us. So, Lord, let your word minister to each and every one of our hearts and minds this morning. All of those that are watching online, those that are listening, minister to them as well. God, we give you all the praise, all the honor, all the glory. We know that we couldn't make it without you. And so we thank you, Lord, for speaking to us. We thank you for what you're going to do in the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Now, I'm going to be going to Jeremiah chapter 32. And uh, I'm going to read something here in a minute at verse 17. I'm going to start, or actually verse 16. But in order to truly appreciate that, you have to kind of know the context of it. If you go into the first part of Jeremiah chapter 32. It does not start out in the Hilton or the Hyatt. Jeremiah is writing this in prison. He is in prison for telling the truth. I've gotten in trouble for telling people the truth. I've had people tell me like, look, how do you think I'm really doing? Like, like hypothetically by faith or reality, which which version? No, no, I want you to be honest with me. I've had them come up like, Pastor, don't, don't, no, no, don't hold back. You tell me if 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 there's something I'm doing. For real? Okay. Boy, next thing I know, I can't believe you said. It. Yeah, I know. I can't believe I thought we were for real either. I know. I my you're doing great. You're doing great. Keep swinging. No. That's, that's just reality. Hey, none of us like that. He goes to the king. He goes to Zedekiah, and Zedekiah, is, you know, he thinks he's doing good. He's the king of Judah. And Jeremiah goes to him, and he says, His, hear the word of the Lord. He says, uh, you're going to be surrounded Nebuchadnezzar is going to come, the king of Babylon. He's going, he's going to surround this city. He's going to take it by siege. He's going to take the city and he's going to lead you away in chains. He's going to lead you shackled and take you all the way back to Babylon. You're going to fight. You're going to do everything you can. You're going to go war to war against the Chaldeans, but you are not going to win this fight. You are going to lose it. This city is going to be destroyed. Well, that wasn't a fun thing to hear. And so when Zedekiah hears what this prophecy that Jeremiah gives him, he takes Jeremiah up and he shuts him away in the dungeon. And Jeremiah, while he's there, he's in the dungeon, in, in, in prison for telling Zedekiah, not only am I in prison, while he's in prison, true to his word and what God had told him, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, they come, they come and take the city by siege. They take the city under control. The Chaldeans, they're going to battle against them. They're losing the battle. The city, everything that he had prophesied is happening. And Jeremiah, sitting here in a dungeon, In a prison, dungeon sounds even more harsh. He's sitting there in this dungeon. Not only is he in prison, he's in prison in a city that is under siege. That's like having a drama in your personal life while you're in the middle of a drama in your family life while they're in the middle of a drama of some great... I mean, you're in a prison, in a prison, in a prison. You're in the inner prison. 
He's sitting there in this, so get that, he's locked away. Not only is he locked away, the city has been surrounded and is being taken over by by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And it is in this dungeon where he's sitting that the scripture says that Hanamel, his uncle's son, he comes in and says, hey, I got a field for sale. Buy my field. I don't know if he was in change. Everybody's like, come closer. <laughs> buy, a, buy some land, you say. <laughs> Where? Right outside. The land that is under siege. You, you would like me while I'm in prison to buy some land that is being taken over by the enemy. You would like me to buy some property that you won't own whether you like it or not in a few days. Wonderful investment. He grew up and went to Enron. <laughs> Some of you won't because they got to be a little older. <laughs> he probably bought a lot of dinar too. <laughs> of course, that's not going to be a real funny joke if all of a sudden it goes to the roof and everybody all of a sudden is wealthy that bought it. He says, you want me to buy some land? He said, yes. He said, you've got the right of inheritance. You're, you're the first family outside of me and the way the custom was in that time if you went to sell some land because you have to remember land was given when they came into the promised land it was given to the tribes and so you couldn't just buy some land from someone in another tribe if you were in the tribe of Benjamin which Jeremiah was when you went to sell your land you had to first give someone in your family the right to buy it so the inheritance of the tribe of Benjamin would stay within and the tribe of Benjamin. He said, you've got the first right of inheritance. You get the first offer to buy. I have to offer it to you first. Now, in my mind, that conversation would have went kind of simple. Well, as you can see, not really a buyer's market. I, I think I'm going to hold up. And just see how it all pans out, okay? Think I'm going to hold out. It looks like we're going to be purchasing some real estate in Babylon. I don't think this, I think this current subdivision is going to be really kind of overvalued right now. I don't see it developing very very well. They've already set that part on fire. That part of the city is burning and that part is ash. And I don't see anybody putting in a Chick-fil-A anytime soon. I don't think I'm going to buy it just yet. But that's not what happens. He's probably getting ready to say that because that's the way we think. But while he's sitting there, Jeremiah is in prison in a city that has been taken control of by the enemy. And while he's there, the Bible says all of a sudden he hears something. It's like a voice says, buy it for thyself. His cousin tells him, buy it for yourself. Now, that would have made sense if he had said, Jeremiah, look, why don't you buy it for your kid that's not in prison? No, no, Jeremiah doesn't even know if he's ever getting out of prison. And his cousin or, or the son of his cousin is like, why don't you buy this for yourself? Be a good investment. Huh, thank you. Can you get one of the guards to come get my wallet? But Jeremiah says when he heard that, he knew that it was from God. What? You, all of that, you didn't recognize that it was from God until somebody said, hey, you ought to buy this for yourself. You want to know why? Because Jeremiah realized that the voice of God a lot of times don't make any sense in the world's market. It doesn't make sense in the world's culture. If the, the problem we've got in a lot of churches now is the culture of the church is developing into a culture that makes sense to the world. That is not a church that can make a difference. We are not part of the, the Bible says we are in the world but not of the world. The culture of the church should not even be uh, even closely si similar to the culture of the world. People ought to walk out from the world and walk into a church and there ought to be a little 
culture shock. It ought to be so different living in the light that when you've been living in darkness, the moment you walk into light, something, oh my goodness, this, this is different than everything. That's because it's another culture. I'll tell you another thing I'm about tired of hearing of. Well, that's not our church's culture. It's not about church culture. It's kingdom culture. If There's a lot of things that are the culture of the world that have become the culture of the church because somebody has evolved. I'm going to tell you how the culture of the church starts looking like the culture of the world. People that come out of the world but don't want to leave the world out of the church and so they bring enough for the world that's what happens you know, you know what the two times you see where God told them he said take all that junk off he said take your bracelets off take your necklace off take your rings off take all the ornaments off take all that junk off you want to know the two times it happened the first time is when they came out and they came out of Egypt and they worshipped it in fact, when Jacob, when he came and he said, when Jacob said, I'm going back to worship, and he says, I want to bury the gods. It doesn't say he took them out of his knapsack. He said, and they took the gods off of their hands. That's the scripture because they worshiped it. It was a deity. Gold was a deity. They worshiped gold. People still worship gold today. They worship green gold. They worship paper gold. They worship the dollar. They, they do. It's a god. And so they took it, and when they came out of Egypt, they said, we're going to take some of Egypt with us. And something got in them in the spirit. And God said, whoa, 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 whoa. You're trying to bring a culture. I tried to bless you and give you some things. But this has become more important even than living for me. That's like when you get to the point where somebody says, well, if I got to live without that in order to be used in ministry, then I'm not willing to do it. Well, that ain't a God. You did not say that. I said it. It's even on tape. Well, if I kind of quit going there in order to be you, then quit it. It's kingdom culture. Well, it's not the culture over there. That's the problem you got a lot. That's why you got 30 different kinds of churches in three square blocks. Because that. Look, I know we have a lot of guests. We're not being ugly to anybody. I promise. I'm just, can I just do a little illustration? I'd normally do better with those. Do I have a volunteer over here? And we're very bold in this place. Look at the hands. Look at the hands. Anybody? Lord, move on someone right now. Oh, Brother Finn. See, I knew it all. Out of every. No, no, no. You don't even have to get up. You can just stay right there. Stand up. Stand up. I need one volunteer in this one. We're equal. Go ahead, Sister Terry. Good. good. What, what about this one? Come on. Bro. Go ahead, Brother Lau. You know, we'll take two. Boy, he, he stood up in advance. So we're okay. Anybody? Brother Caleb, stand up. Got a lot of men. Come on, we, we believe in equality. Any women in this section too? Just one. Come on. There we go. What about this? Just, there we go. Right back here. One, oh, man, I got two. Man, this is a volunteer. This, I'm going to call this the volunteer section. That is popping up like popcorn. Come on, we got anybody there? Okay. Now, y'all just stand up. Now, I'm going to give you the right to do something. Now, you're not going to be vocal. You know what? We need a volunteer in the balcony too. Come on, Sister Crindy. I knew you was going to be right there. You know what? I'll make this easier. Ooh, nah, I ain't going to put the pressure on the platform, boy. They... <laughs> do it. Now, who's the vi- hey, Come on, you, you're my man today. So come on, brother. Now, here's what I want you to do. I'm not saying you're doing it. Here's what I want. When you look at a platform or you look at a ministry guideline or a ministry or you see people, I just want you to raise your hand. I'm not saying you disagree. I'm not saying because I, I know who's standing. These are everybody and precious people. I'm just saying in your mind, if, if you thought about it, there's probably something you may do a little bit different if it were you. Is that true? Okay. Is there anything that if, if, you, if you were the pastor, are, are, are there things? At, that's a good volunteer. She said, nope, I'd do it that way every day. You got the job. I'll tell you what. We... But have you ever seen something that you're like, you know what? I may would do this a little different. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you, you're hired for everything. But you got to have somebody perfect in the group, so we got one. Anybody, anything, Brother Lau? Any... I like that. He said, burn out for Jesus. We'll just make a blanket statement because I'm just saying, let's say you got an idea. Maybe there's something pastor asked. It's a little outside of what you think is necessary. I understand. 
Here's the problem we get. If I go to Sister Jennifer and like, you know, Sister Jennifer, you, you, you're kind of right. You know, you, you do say, look, we're going to, okay, we're going to do that. Oh, Brother Jeff, you got a little bit, okay. Brother Gabriel, oh, he sees it. Oh, everybody, you, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Thirteen different opinions in a church of six hundred something people. Let's just assume we got thirteen different opinions. That's a pretty fair assumption. If just us that are standing, and these are good people, just changed everything just to accommodate these 13 different ways, the entire culture of the church just changed. And you can be seated. Thank you. Oh, and you, Brother Kennedy. I wasn't going to let you disagree in public. So I said, no, I'm good. That's my man right there. He's awesome. 14. Fourteen different. That's all it takes. Fourteen people like, ah, you know what I just, I don't think wearing that's a big deal. Okay, we'll change it. Well, I don't think not going there is a big deal. It wasn't a big deal at the last church that you left. You want me to be like the place you didn't want to stay? Was that too close to home? It felt a little close. Well, I was trying to get it as close as possible. I was trying to hit you. Well, I just don't think a man has to do that. I don't think it's a big deal. Okay, we'll go with that. Well, I don't think you don't have to cut that. No, I think you can wear that, and I think you can go there. I don't see how that word's a big deal. I don't think that's a big deal. I think, okay, let's just say the rest of you, you just got to like it or lump it. But you 14 special, we're going to work with you. You'll come to a different church next Sunday. That's all it takes for some of the culture to go. That's all it takes. Because not everybody is going to spend. I ask people, something like, I think we ought to change. I'm like, okay, how many days have you fasted over this? How many times have you been in prayer? You don't know that we ought to live like this? How many prayer rooms have you walked out of that this has been on your heart? Well, nothing. I was just watching how something happened over here, and I kind of developed. Uh-uh. If you're going to develop a culture, you've got to develop it in a prayer room. You've got to develop it in the Word. I don't want to develop a culture because of what somebody over here found an easier way to do. I don't want to develop a culture because Egypt was able to do it. I don't want to develop... God said, get all that stuff off of you. I'm taking you to the promised land, and you got another culture trying to come with you. He said, fine, you want to do it your way? There's the promised land. You can have the promised land, but I'm not going with you. He said, now, if you'll take all that junk off, I'll go with you because it's going to be my culture or it's going to be the world's culture. It ain't First Pentecostal Church over here culture, Porter Apostolic culture, First Pentecostal. Ah, it's kingdom culture. It's church culture. It, it's not an individual. It's about the kingdom. Hey, it, that culture has got to be the same whether it's in Africa, Porter, Louisiana, Missouri, Mississippi. It's kingdom. This ain't Pastor McCoy's culture. My culture don't matter. It's I got no culture. It's got to be God's culture. Is it pleasing to God? Am I I holding on to this because the world says this is important because this is the way the world... The next time you read about it, you read when when they're in Rome. Now you're in the New Testament. Well, that was Old Testament stuff. Well, let's hop over to the New Testament. I know this is different for Sunday morning. It's going a little different. I'll probably finish it up tonight. You know what he tells him in Rome? Peter comes up once again. Why are these the two why are these the two times where where he's addressing all Peter boy, he goes all in. You want to talk about you think I'm rough, man. Imagine Peter. It's hard to dispute the guy that just got done walking on water. Of course, we find a way to critique that too. Winston Churchill said. Once he said, man, these media people hate me so much. He said, if I got up in the morning and walked on water, they'd write, it's because I can't swim. Let me tell you, you can't win. You just got to live for God and not worry about anybody else. As my grandmother used to say, it'll all come out in the wash. Peter comes and he tells him, hey, get all that stuff off. He said, quit wearing that. Quit doing that. 
He said, why? Or are you saying, he said, no, but it's the culture of Rome. And Rome's culture is we make a God out of anything. We make a God out of ourselves. He said they were walking around with their necks stretched out and their chest puffed out and they'd adorn themselves head to foot. Why? He said they're trying to show the world, look who we are. Look, we're something special. He said that stuff don't adorn you. I adorn you. They don't look at you and see all the world. They look at you and they see me. Well, how are they going to know if I'm married? He said they'll see your spirit. They'll see a right spirit. How they... How are they going to know what I, he said, you can't hide truth. You can't have a right, you can't hide a right spirit. You can't hide a right attitude. You can't hide holiness. Let me tell you, you, you. Well, you're just talking about doing all the outside. No, 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 no. Let me tell you something. If the outside is all the way down to a T and it's still ugly from the spirit on the inside, that's not holiness. That's called pretending. That's hypocrisy at its finest. It, the outside can look great and you can have it all down and it can be completely ruined because every time you open your mouth, it's to gossip or tear somebody down or to walk around like I'm better than anybody else and we go to this church. Ah, I'm not better than any. Well, you're the pastor. Yep, and the chief of sinners and I ain't as good as anybody in this place. I need God more than anybody in here. I need the altar. I need repentance. I am a nobody that God has been good to. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve to be your pastor. I don't deserve deserve the wife I got. I don't deserve the kids I've got. I don't deserve the life I live. I don't deserve to have Bishop or Sister Green. I don't deserve to be holding this mic. I know who I am. I am a nobody that God has been good to and I live every day hanging on to mercy that I didn't deserve and grace that I could never hope for and that's all I am and I'm fine if that's all I'll ever be. It don't matter if I never make another mistake for the rest of my life. I will walk into heaven and un undeserving sinner saved by grace he told him he said I don't want them to see he said get all that stuff off he said you've let their culture become your culture and now what makes them stand out is what you've tried to allow to become what makes you stand out he said but I'm what makes you stand out now I got to get back to this scripture. See, man, that was, you got to be careful when you take those detours. I didn't. I thought I was going around a pothole. It was a mountain. <laughs> Jeremiah told him, "I'm gonna finish this tonight." By the way, I'm not gonna get in, get into all this. In fact, musicians, you can start getting ready. Jeremiah said, "The word of the Lord came to him. He said, I know you're in prison, and I know the city's under siege by land.'" That's how you know it's from God. You know what the voice of God will tell you? There's two voices that will come at you when you're going through a battle. When everything in you feels like letting go, you'll know it's God when that voice, in spite of everything going wrong, there's that little voice, Brother Adam says, Go ahead and go another step higher. What? Another step? You? Not, I just fell all the way down the stairs. I know. Let's go higher than we've ever been. That's God. It's God that reached. How do I know it's God? Because it's only God. I'll tell you what the voice of the enemy sounds like. Oh, no, no, no. You should quit. You shouldn't have to do that. Look what you've been through. You ought to just walk down another few stairs just to make it easier. You don't need to do. Uh-uh. Why? Because the enemy wants me to live at a lower level. But I tell you when it's God, you have, to, you have to have creative power to look at creation and say, hey, you can do better. I'm at my worst. I know. But I created you. And because I know what's inside of you. I'm telling you, you can live at a higher level. That's how God speaks to us. Well, I just got out of rehab. I know. But when God speaks to you, he says, that's all right. You're never going back. Well, man, it looks like we're headed to the divorce court. What's, what's, what's the voice of God sound like when I'm going about to go through a divorce? I'll tell you what his voice sounds like. Hold on. Go ahead and love them like you've never loved them. Start praying for them. Start having peace and joy. Start treating them. Back. Incidentally, we'll do a little marital counseling. Love is not a feeling. 
That feeling is a reaction to choices. How do you know? I know some in here have them. I'm I'm, going to shatter your whole worldview. That little piece of metal around your finger is not what holds your marriage together. How do you know? Because in America, we wear more than any other country in the world, and 52% of our marriage is in a divorce. That little sucker ain't doing its job. And some people have an affairs when they don't even take them off. I called someone the other day and said, I could never get rid of this. It's a sign that I'm married. You cheated four times. I'd get rid of it. I think that thing's cursed. You need a stop sign is what you need. I'll tell you what, we'll check. Well, I don't feel it anymore. They don't. I just, we, we don't feel the same about each other. I asked this. I've asked this for five and six different couples just in the last year. I said, do you remember the last time you felt that? Oh, yeah, I do. I said, T- tell me, when, when was the last time you felt that way towards each other? Oh, it was 1943. <laughs> he said, you know what? He said, Boy, they'll start describing it. I said, what, what are some of the things you did? Oh, he used to pick me up and we'd go down by the reservoir and we'd just skip rocks and we'd pack a little sandwich and he'd just sit there and he'd write me poems and he'd do this and oh, we, oh my goodness, it was this. Or, oh, oh, she used to surprise me. I'd get to work and I'd find little messages in, in, in my lunchbox or in my car or whatever. I'd get on break and I'd just find little I love you notes. Sometimes I'd get off of work and if he got off early, he'd leave a sticky note on my window telling me, hey, beautiful, I love you, can't wait to see you. Oh, it was just, I used to get roses for no reason. Baby, close your ears. Don't listen to this. It's going to put a lot of pressure on. I come home and it'd be this and it. We used to walk through and he just grabbed my hand and we just walked through the mall. You need to hold your wife's hand when you walk through public. The whole world ought to know that you're proud of what you got. You don't hold her, hold her hand. Somebody else will try to hold her hand. No, no, with both hands. You got to hold her hand and you got to keep a fist for the other one trying to hold her hand. In the name of Jesus. Now the Bible says lay hands on no man suddenly. They don't say nothing about fist. Don't slap them. Punch them. No. I, I, I can't. Do we have any attorneys? Can I get sued for that? Strike that. Not them. No, well. I don't know, Gordon. Lord must have wanted to confirm it. Strike them. You ought to be protected. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you. And so I asked myself, listen. I said, y'all still hold hands? Only when we reach for the milk at the same time. I grabbed her hand the other day. She was fixing to slap me, so I grabbed it. I'm like, y'all ever leave it? You ever leave notes? Like, I get a lot of mean text. I said, when's the last time y'all just took off and just went back down by a lake or river or whatever, and y'all just, just sit down and talked about your dreams and what you want? No, we don't. We went down the whole list. They don't do any of it anymore. I said, I can tell you where those feelings went. You quit doing the things that brought those feelings. And so the feelings left. Now you want to leave a relationship because the feeling's gone. Don't do that. Go back to doing what you were doing when you were madly head over heels in love for each other. I said, you start Feelings follow action. Start treating each other the way you used to and watch those feelings come back. You'll be like, man, I, I can't believe it. Man, that love is resurrected. I'm telling you, it'll happen. In fact, a lot of it will happen in church because people tell me the same thing about church. But I just don't fit. When I first came in, I didn't care what it took. I, I'm like, okay, let me ask you, how many times did you miss church? Oh, I didn't miss church for nothing. We didn't miss church. I'd quit my job. I said, how many times did you go to the prayer room? Oh, I was in the prayer room every service. I said, when it came time to pray or go to the altar, oh, man, every service. I said, you do that now? What? No, no. I mean, we don't do it. It's the same thing. You quit doing the things that brought you close to him. 
Now you're wondering what's wrong. Why is God so far from me? Y'all just quit hanging out. And it ain't because of him. Start putting him first again and watch. That love will come back to life. There will be something all of a sudden. You mean, man, man, I feel stronger than I've ever felt. It will come back. That's how you know when it's God's voice. When everything around you says to quit and there's a voice that says, I got an opinion. Hold on. Everything's falling apart. I know. Hold on. Double down on everything. That's what Jeremiah is saying. I, 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 man, I, I got to quit this. I'm, I'm going to finish it tonight. I'm going to bring it to a close right now. Jeremiah tells him, he says, what, what do I do? And he goes to God and he tells him, he says, listen. And I'm going to he goes to verse 16. And he tells God, he, he, or, or before he goes to 16, he tells God, he says, listen. Huh. He says something, verse 17. That's what it was. He says, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee he says God I'm in prison and I'm in prison in a city that is surrounded by the enemy and about to be destroyed and you want me to buy land in this environment in this place that is about by your word to be destroyed and so he he begins to talk to God and he says listen I know that you made the whole earth. I know about your power and, and, and how mighty you are. And I know that there is nothing too hard for you. He says, I know. And he goes down further. And he says, listen, I, I know that you show loving kindness to thousands. And there are consequences for the actions of what we do. I know you are the great, the mighty God. That your counsel is great. You are mighty in work. Your eyes see everything, everywhere. And you award people according to their due. He said, you've done signs and wonders in Egypt. You brought forth the people out of Egypt with, with a strong hand. And you gave them this land. He said, and I know... I know that they walked away from you and they went against your word and they went against what you told them to do. And I know that because they have turned away from you that they have been taken into bondage. They have been destroyed. The cities and the land have been turned upside down because they have walked away from you. He said, I understand that. I understand it. He said, but now... I, I know how we got here. I know where you brought us from. But now we are in bondage. Now the city is being burned with fire. I'm in prison in the middle of a city that is under siege and it's about to be destroyed. Why do you want me to buy a field? And God answers and says this. Behold, I am the Lord. The God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? He said, put your money where your mouth is, Jeremiah. You said I can do anything. Can I or can I not do anything? There's, he start. remember... Jeremiah starts his prayer, and you'll stand with me. Jeremiah starts his prayer. There's nothing too hard for you. And God comes back and says, is there anything too hard for me, Jeremiah? You said there wasn't. I'm going to give you a chance to prove you, to prove your word. Is there anything that I cannot do? No, God, you can do anything. He said, okay. Then I, what I want you to realize, yes, they're fixing to get taken away. They're going to get destroyed. They walked away from me. They've allowed another culture to take them around. They're never going to be what I created them to be while they're holding on to the culture of the world. And the only way I can get that out is I got to let some things fall apart. I got to let some things be destroyed because I'm not trying to create a better worldly culture. I'm trying to bring about a kingdom culture. 
culture and I am trying to make you what I created you to be and I've got to let these things be destroyed. He said, but my promises are yea and amen and I do not lie and if you believe that I can do anything and if you believe that I do not lie, then Jeremiah, you've got to believe that after I get this thing all back and worked out and once I get this junk out of their lives, I am bringing my people back to where I promised them and they will buy land again in this place he said take your deed he said put your deed in a place where it will be safe and save it for a later day I'm asking he said I'm telling you buy the field you know my uncle used to tell me you know all of my family every single one of them everybody does real estate and boy, I've heard this so many times. And I've missed some good deals. Man, I was 21 years old. I, this is, I just started my second business. Man came up to me, said, man, listen. He said, uh, I got an old gas station. He said, it, man, it's falling apart. The walls are coming down. He said, I'll sell it to you for $25,000. I'm like, I don't want an old busted up gas station. He said, well, it's got... It's got two tanks that are in the ground. It's going to cost you $10,000. I already got the bid. He said, look, he was almost 90 years old. He said, I don't feel like messing with it. He said, but if you'll do it, it was your grandpa, Haley. He said, Joel, he said, I'm going to help you. He said, I want you to buy this little piece of property from me. He said, I'm telling you, it's going to do good. I, want... I said, her grandpa, everybody called him Pop. He said, Pop, what am I going to what am I going to do with a, a, a gas? I said, I don't know what I'd do. I don't need, I passed on it. Today, it's worth $250,000. But I don't own it. They built a, they bought the part behind it. They'd already bought it, but nobody knew what they were going to do with it. They turned it into the shopping center. You can't have an entrance into a shopping center within so many distance of a stop sign. And the closest place to the stop sign and the stoplight that you can put in an entrance to turn in was where that little gas station was. I spent my whole life wishing I'd have bought a $25,000 busted up gas station that hadn't worked in 20 years. You just miss it. You want to know why? Because you don't make money when you sell. This may not make sense. People are like, yeah, you do. That's when you make. Nope. You make your money when you buy. You buy real estate when it doesn't look like anybody wants it because you got a vision of what's going to be in the area down the road, and you have to see value in things before it becomes evident to everybody else. When it becomes the ever evident to everybody else, well, then everybody's willing to pay top dollar. You've got to learn to see value in something before, the, before it's recognizable to the whole world. And you can't do that without a vision. The Bible says without a vision, my people perish. What are you talking about? The Bible says buy the truth and sell it not. I, I, I'm talking to some buyers of truth today. That's what he was telling Jeremiah. Jeremiah, you got to learn to buy some things. I'm, you got to learn to buy into some promises. When everything around you looks like the promise is gone, you got to double down and hold on to everything God told you he was going to do. Well, it looks like my family's falling apart, but God said that he was going to keep his hand on it. So I, I ain't giving up. I'm not heading to court. Uh-uh. I'm fixing to double down. I'm going to pray like I've never. Oh, my kid. Man, my kid is, is going through it right now. I don't care. The Bible says if we if we would raise them in truth when they do, when they grow older they would not depart from it. You want hey, you want to know why our world's in trouble? Because our kids get 16, 17, 18 years old, 12 and 13, and all of a sudden we want to invest truth in them. Uh Uh-uh. If your kids, you ought to thank a Sunday school teacher today because right now, before you're even there, before they've hit the troubles and the trials of life, somebody's putting truth into them saying, hey, I'm investing something. It doesn't doesn't even look like it's needed. Why are you bringing your kid to the altar? He's six years old. What's he fighting? Uh Uh-uh. I'm putting some things in practice. I'm teaching him some things now. So that, oh, I'm done. I'm done. I'm closing. I'll, I'll finish the rest of it tonight. Four years old. 
four years old, my daddy, every time we'd go to service, how many of you got a kid three or four years old? My daddy would bring me up there, one of these bus loose. We'd go up, we had an upstairs prayer room. My daddy would take me upstairs. He'd put a big chair out for him. He put a little chair out for me. He said, come on, Bubba, sit right down. Four years old. What? Let me tell you, I didn't pray any earth-shaking prayers at four years old. I promise you. You don't know what you did. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm telling you. I'd probably stolen a popsicle from somebody that morning. I was probably praying under duress because of conviction. My daddy say, you sit there. And you know what he would tell me? Now, the world will say this is a cult. The world will say, I can't believe you do that. Who cares? They got kids walking through the hallways of a school acting like they're some little Furby kitty cat or something, and we can't say nothing when they start meowing at each other. And I'm weird. Go bark at a tree. America used to be something. Now they're not even going to send soldiers to take over. They're going to send animal control. Like, are you ready to go to war? No. Got kitty cats and puppies headed to protect me. I'll do it myself. Well, that's why we, no offense, Sister Mary, and all the wonderful Christian counselors that are doing the best they can. But not everybody. You, are, you go to counseling, you get you a Christian counselor. And if their counseling doesn't match up with the word, fire that one and get another one. That was a pretend Christian counselor. I talked to a man last night. He said, man, one of my buddies, he was kind of depressed. He was going through something. Next thing I know, he came and he talked to me. And he said, well, he said, "Uh, I'm changing my name. I'm going to be a girl now. 25 years old. He said, oh, okay. He said, man, "Man, we grew up together. He said, you know, how long have you been homosexual? He's like, no, no. He said, I, I like girls. This is, this is real. This, this is real life. This is the world we live in. Next time somebody tells you, oh, that's a cult. Tell me, you out crazied us long enough. This world is cuckoo for cocoa puffs. Well, he said, no, 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 no. He said, uh, my counselor told me. The reason I still like girls, but I'm also a, a little girl inside. I'm a transgender lesbian. That's why I'm depressed. That's the counseling of the world to a young man going through a hard time. I don't care what you say about the way we shout and the way we run. If that's what you're producing, I'll keep the word. I don't. Who cares what they think? I say all that because they'd probably think what I said next would be some kind of punishment. My daddy said, Bubba, I want you to pray there. Daddy, what do I say? I can still remember. He'd say, you just say what I say. I didn't even know how to pray good prayer. I would just repeat everything my daddy would say. I'd be, I'd be crying. Why? Daddy's crying. Well, that didn't make a difference. Oh, I beg to differ. Because when I was 23 years old, and my life was messed up and there wasn't anywhere I could go for help and there wasn't anybody that I could go and bear my soul and I didn't know how to get out of addiction I just buried my eighth friend in three years from overdosing one overdosing in the seat next to me from being shot by a rival gang from being stabbed from killing themselves from wrapping their cars around trees coming back from parties my eighth friend And all of a sudden, it started getting close to home. And I didn't know who to go to. And Daddy couldn't fix it. And I didn't want to tell my mama everything I was dealing with. But Daddy taught me a lesson. From the time I was four years old, he said, let me tell you, I'm going to put some things in you. It don't look like it's necessary yet. But I'm going to start early. And I'm going to make sure that this place, this prayer room, and this altar is a familiar place. Because one day, 
All of you that are dedicating your babies next week, let me tell you, right now, get the, there will be a day when you won't have the answers for what they're going through. And you won't know how to get them through the trial. But the best thing you can do is to introduce them to someone who will always be available and who they can always get a hold of. And I'm going to tell you, I remember, and I've told this story so many times. I remember I went there. Two, three o'clock in the morning. I don't remember what it was when I finally came home. Went up to my daddy's side of the bed. Woke him up. Daddy, can I have your keys? What you, what you need, bud? Daddy, can I, can I have your key? What, what keys you need, bud? To the shop? To the truck? Wait, wait, wait. Can I get your church keys? What, what, what's going on, Daddy trying to hold back tears, trying to act like I've got it all together, knowing that there's no way they can fix what's going on in my life. I don't even want to tell them what all I'm dealing with. Daddy, can I please, can I just have your keys? Finally, give me the keys. Got in my truck. It's 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm headed down to 2500 25th Street, Port Arthur, Texas, and pulling into that first Pentecostal church, unlocking that door, walking in, and walking into an old familiar altar and laying on that altar and saying, God, can you help me? What happened? I felt his presence. Daddy taught me there was somewhere I could go. I didn't realize I needed it at four years old, but let me tell you, there came a day where I needed it more than I needed anything else in my life, and I'm thankful for a daddy that said, "Uh uh-uh, we're going to sell a lot of things, but we're not going to sell truth, and we're not going to let go of an altar, and we're not going to let go of a king. Uh -uh, I bought this to hold. So I'm here to tell somebody this morning, I don't know where you're at, and I, you have to get the second part tonight. I'll finish it tonight. But I'm telling you, there's somebody, and you feel like letting go when the enemy's telling you, uh-uh, this is the end of the rope. But I'm telling you, uh-uh, you go ahead and double down. No, 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 my God doesn't know how to fail. I don't know how he's going to work it out. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know how he's going to restore my marriage. I don't know how he's going to put my family back together. I don't know how he's bringing my children home. I don't know how he's going to heal my mind. But one thing, I know he does not fail and he does not forget his promises is there anybody in this place tonight or this morning they'd like to find somewhere around an altar and say God I'm holding on I'm not letting go today I'm not let, I, I still remember some things you promised me they haven't come to pass it's not a bed of roses yet it's not all rainbows and sunshine we're still going through some troubled times but I'm not letting go and I'm not giving up you gave me some promises and your words do not fail come on Come on, I'm talking to a mom and a daddy. There's a lot of things pulling for your attention, but I'm telling you, it's time for you to double down the truth. It's time for you to invest everything you got. If you're going to invest your life in anything, invest it in the kingdom, invest it in an altar, invest it into prayer, invest it into the word. If you're going to wrap your family's lives up around anything, wrap them up around the things of God.
to be on your daughters. That he'll protect them from everything in this world. That he'll keep his hand to protect.